For many years, Pike's Nursery in Metro Atlanta used a tagline in their advertising that surely was stolen right straight out of the Bible. It was, in fact, among the first things that God ever said to humans. To Adam and Eve, he said, play in the dirt. Now, I'm quite sure that for Pike, the bottom line of their uh, profit sheet had more to do with playing in the dirt than was God's intention. After all, when I go to play in the dirt, it's often preceded by a rather expensive trip to Pike's. But the truth of the matter is, no matter who you are and where you come from and what your worldview is, you can learn a lot by simply playing in the dirt. I tell you that primarily to, to say that from my earliest years to the very present, I have been playing in the dirt, broadly speaking, all my life. And from these experiences, I've learned a lot about life and a lot about what it authentically means to be a human being, even in places in life where I've been asked to be a leader. One of those lessons is transformative leaders know how to shovel. Much of my growing up years involved living on a dairy farm. It was legally my grandfather's dairy farm, but my dad was very involved and I spent all kinds of time hanging out at the dairy barn. As the oldest son, I, our oldest grandson, I occupied a pretty privileged place in the pecking order of Southern family life in those days. There were about 60 Guernsey cows on my granddad's dairy farm, and each one of them had a name. There was a cow named for every month of the year and every day of the week. Queen Elizabeth, named for the Queen of England, perhaps reflecting a bit of a Tory spirit that still exists in the low country of South Carolina, she occupied the chief place in the Huxford Dairy Farms Cowdom. She, uh, one of my favorite, favorite cow names was Theme Song. Theme Song got her name because she was born one summer during vacation Bible school. That trauma that boys had to go to for two weeks back in those days rather than playing outside like all good boys should. And I came home singing the theme song. So my granddad said, well, let's call this calf Theme Song. And that was her name forever. I can still see April in my mind's eye. April was named, obviously, for the month of April. And one morning, riding Bill, the Tennessee walking horse that was on the farm, I ran up on April, who had died during the night, giving birth to a calf. The dairy barn that my grandfather built was equipped with electric milkers and a huge refrigerated tank where milk was kept until Coburg Dairy's big truck came by every other day to pick up the milk and take it to be processed. I grew up drinking milk out of that tank. And to this day, I refuse to drink milk out of a plastic jug. Maybe playing in the dirt helps you learn some important creation care lessons like the inappropriateness of plastic to store milk at a very early age. The dairy barn itself was my favorite place to be. Eight cows came in at a time when it was milking time. Over the years, they perfected their own little pecking order and you could almost make a roll sheet and take the roll in order. Early every morning, I didn't always make the 4 a.m. calls. And 4 o'clock every afternoon, I seldom missed those calls. The cows would come in eight at a time. The first round of eight, Queen Elizabeth was at the head of the line. Always, she never missed. And they would come in and they would stick their heads in these things called stanchions, which were then closed so they would stay in their place while they were being milked. And one of the bonuses of coming in to be milked is 
they were all fed what we called sweet food, a special mixture for milking cows made by Purina. Well, if you've ever been around farm animals very much, you won't be surprised to know that once they were in the barn, settled down and began eating, inevitably something would happen on the other end. It never failed. But dairy farmers were pretty smart folks and they had it all figured out. So right down the middle of the milking room was a trough. It was about four inches deep and about 12 inches wide. And it was positioned in exactly the right place to take care of the problem when it happened. And as soon as it happened, there was a square faced shovel leaning on the wall and you just picked it up and you pushed that problem right straight out of the barn where later somebody would come and pick it up and fertilize something. Maybe another creation care lesson learned. That routine went on twice a day, 365 days a year, holidays included. Several guys worked for my grandfather in the dairy farm. And between my granddad's leadership and the good work these guys did, they had that process down to a science when it came to efficiency. My grandfather was in many ways kind of a quintessential Southern farmer whose life spanned most of the 20th century. He was born in 1902 and died in the mid 1980s. He never made tons of money as a dairy farm, but he lived a good life. He lived a life of significance and was a wise man. But he wasn't just a dairy farmer, though that would not have been a particularly bad thing. From a very early time in his life, he got involved in county politics. So during the Second World War, he served on a committee that was responsible for rationing gasoline and sugar to all the residents of Berkeley County, South Carolina, so everyone would get a fair shake. He spent decades on the County Agricultural Committee, which was a committee designed to help farmers be more productive. He was well respected as a gentleman, as a farmer, as a wise counselor, he was, in the eyes of many people, what we might in our day and time call a transformative leader, though he might not recognize that vocabulary. Well, I remember one afternoon, just after the 4 p.m. milking routine began, and the first round of eight cows had entered the barn, that Mr. Goodyear, the county agent, stopped by to visit my grandfather. He was at least smart enough to know that it was not a bad idea to visit the farmers who sat on the committee who, in essence, either hired or fired him as Berkeley County's county extension agent. He was a graduate of Clemson University with a degree in agriculture and was quite impressed with what he knew about farming, though, in fact, he had never been a farmer. When he finished, uh, sure enough, it's no sooner than Mr. Goodyear had walked into the dairy barn that those first eight cows began to do what cows tend to do when you put sweet food in front of them on one end and there's a trough on the other. So as soon as that began to happen, my grandfather, the owner of the dairy farm, the boss of the people who worked for him, a member of the esteemed County Agricultural Committee. My grandfather picked up a shovel, that flat faced shovel by the door, and he started pushing the problem out of the back of the barn. When he finished, Mr. Goodyear seemed to be a bit frustrated by the whole scene. And he said to my grandfather, Mr. Huxford, a man of your stature, shouldn't be doing things like shoveling manure out of a barn. You've got workers who can do that. My grandfather looked at Mr. Goodyear, and I can't say quite as directly as my 12-year-old ears heard that day, 
But my grandfather, whose vocabulary could be a little salty occasionally, he said, Mr. Goodyear, if you want a glass of cold milk at the end of the day, you need to shovel some manure along the way. I have no idea why that story stuck in my brain nearly 60 years ago. But I can see the conversation happening as though it were yesterday. Mr. Goodyear was a bit short and stocky, and he had a completely bald head back in the day when completely bald heads weren't all that cool. My grandfather was a good bit taller, and he typically wore a pair of olive green work pants and a matching shirt. It was summertime, so he had a straw hat on, and almost always he had an unlit cigar hanging out of the right side of his mouth. I don't know. Maybe playing in the dirt is one of the ways important, vital lessons sort of get planted deep, deep within our consciousness. My grandfather actually dropped out of school before graduating because of World War I. However, any MBA program could profit from a three-hour course titled Transformative Leaders Need to Know How to Shovel. When I read books on leadership, especially the kind of books that clutter our bookstores and sometimes even worse, our Christian bookstores, it seems to me that often the primary focus on leadership is all about position and not about function. But when I read biographies of great leaders, it seems to me that their lives were almost always characterized by an approach that says leadership should be more functional than positional. In my story about the dairy farm, Mr. Goodyear was more focused on positional leadership and my grandfather was more focused on functional leadership. It's not an entirely different idea from what more academic scholars like Bernard Bass would have looked upon as transactional leadership for Mr. Goodyear and transformational leadership for my grandfather. James McGregor Burns, another academic researcher of our day and time, says that good leaders, functional leaders, focus on moving people from either where they were or from where they are to become more productive and, and significant in their life's work. That's exactly what David Brooks, in his outstanding new book titled The Second Mountain Means, when he says that real leaders know that significance is always going to be more valuable than mere achievement. But positional leaders can be quickly drawn to being impressed with their position. Remember Mr. Goodyear's comment to my grandfather? Mr. Huxford, a man of your stature? Position. Here's the problem. It doesn't matter if you're the leader of a small rural dairy in the 1950s and 60s and 70s in the middle of nowhere in Berkeley County, South Carolina, or the president of some modern company, your position is really not that big of a deal. Currently, I am the dean of the College of Biblical Studies and Ministry at Point University. I am honored to be that person. But the truth is, according to the United Nations, this month, the population of planet Earth will reach 7.7 billion people. And about 99.9999999% of those people don't even know there is a Point University, much less my position in it. But when I'm a positional leader, my position can easily be seen as my most important asset. As Jamie and Marion Shokire suggest in authentic conversations, this kind of leader tends to view people in a mechanistic kind of way, and all workers are, are little pieces of some machine that has to achieve some 
external goal. As a positional leader, I thrive on a kind of bureaucracy that makes the employee handbook almost like the Bible itself. And new operational rules get passed out all the time. And, and I insist that people stay in their place. And of course, I make sure that I never be caught doing something beneath my positional place in the organization. To again acknowledge David Brooks in the second mountain, that's achievement over significance. Functional leaders, on the other hand, they don't get too impressed with self. And they don't insist that you always have to recognize their position. The truth of the matter is that sometimes functional leaders sort of get in trouble because they want to be functioning in every single thing and don't always take care of some details. But functional leaders want to be team players, not bosses, a quality that Patrick Lencioni describes as essential for healthy organizations. But a functional leader thinks not so much about his or her status, but about what he or she has been called or commissioned, if you prefer a less theological word, commissioned to do. You see, I'd much rather talk to you about how many students I take out to lunch and breakfast all the time, or the kinds of conversations I get to have in classrooms and in my office and in hallways, or the number of students who ask me to officiate at their weddings. I could talk to you about that all day long. I'd much rather do that than give you the details of my position as a college dean. A functional leader may not even know there is an employee handbook filled with rules because functional leaders think in terms of principles, not rules. And principles that when applied to a given situation can transform people and organizations and businesses, and universities, and churches, and who knows, it could possibly even transform politics, though that might be a stretch. When the focus is transformation, there's a moral and ethical imperative to help others reach their best potential, not to merely transactionally check off a box when some task is finally completed. This is a kind of culture that Authentic Conversations describes as wanting to create an organizational culture that maximizes the potential of the entire organization, not just the upper management folks. If I were teaching that three hour MBA class titled, Transformational Leaders Know How to Shovel the primary learning objective would be something like this. Rules, positions, at best, can monitor behavior. Principles and functions can transform organizations. Here's the deal. I kind of like the idea of a nice glass of cold, gray day, non-pasteurized Guernsey milk from that refrigerator that was in my granddad's barn way back in the 60s. But I'm pretty sure that what my 12-year-old ears heard in the summer of 1963 from my uneducated but wise grandfather ring true. That won't happen if you aren't willing to shovel some manure during the day. Transformative leaders need to know how to shovel. Maybe we should just go and unbox the shovels hidden in our own barns and start transforming wherever it is that we are privileged to be a leader. Thank you.